Welcome back, everyone. Uh, David, it's really good to have you here. Uh, David, you're the founder of Macrodesiac. Tell me a bit about your background and what you do, how you've gotten here. Yeah, of course. Cheers for having me, Ricardo. Um, it's really, really good to be joining CMC to have a chat about markets today. But yeah, so Macrodesiac, I founded after leaving Broking. And, you know, I was writing a note every single day on LinkedIn. And it was appealing to sort of the institutional crowd, other traders and that mm. kind of thing. But then I thought, you know, there, there's a much better audience that this can appeal to where you're taking the complexities of research and making it a little bit simpler, you know, as if you're having a conversation, that kind of thing. Whereas, you know, what's out there at the moment is there's there's research that is either too sort of corporate, too institutional, which is fine, you know, compliance has to do things in a certain mm. way and things have to be worded in certain ways. But then there's other research which takes all the complex bits and just dumbs them down too much. So we thought, let's find a happy medium between those. And now we've got like 10,000 subscribers. Um, and yeah, we're just, we're, we're growing it. Fantastic. No, I really appreciate that. I think, you know, let's start off with the markets a little bit. I really want to touch upon the core headline recently on what's really going on with the Chinese economy, right? There's the Asian markets have been under pressure because of what's been going on. Um, and let's, let's go through a few facts. So China's 10 year government bond yield has been the lowest since COVID. Uh, you see the economy is experiencing deflation. You know, that's now going to export that deflation to other countries, more specifically the US, we can go into a bit more detail there. Um, but also the new home prices fall for the first time. So certainly there's some concerns there. What are we looking at? Where next for that economy and other economies that are depending on China? Yeah, so I think that firstly, whenever I talk about China, um, I like to frame China a little bit differently versus how we'd frame an economy, maybe in the West, this experience in similar things. Um, so it's important mm. to recognize that the CCP is not like a Western government. Mm. A lot of what the CCP does is very much face saving. Mm. Um, and this isn't a negative, by the way. This isn't a negative at all. Um, it's very much face saving. For example, they suspended the youth uh, unemployment data just a couple of days ago mm. and reinstated it with a clean version. OK, I think we can all allude to what that means. Mm. But at the same time, the UK during COVID, they changed the GDP numbers and that and how that's measured so mm. these things do happen and again it's not a negative it's possibly just a way in which they reinforce some sort of credibility mm -hmm. if you like um so in terms of the deflation side though you're absolutely right you know that exported deflation can occur and we're seeing it through ppi mm. uh you know producer price index in the us even in germany we've seen the pr producer price index completely collapse in the uk we've seen it and that does tend to have uh, you know, uh, a kind of a lead time on CPI. Mm. And as you're referencing with the UK CPI number, you know, it's disinflationary, but it did beat the expectation. Mm. It depends on what time period you're looking at things over. If you're an intraday trader, you're going to look at the beat as like, oh yeah, I want to get long cable, mm. right? But if you're looking at a bit of a longer term, you're like, okay, is now maybe the, the right time to start scaling into... UK gilts, for example, mm. you know, maybe there's VGov that you can look at. So it kind of depends, yeah, on what time frame you're looking at things over. But, you know, that that UK inflation number in the previous data with wage growth, that wage growth number was slightly anomalous because it was taken into account. I think it was 7.8%. It, it well beat, basically, 7.8%. Mm. Um, but it was taken into account the uh, the bonus paid to NHS workers back in May. So I think the market took it as, okay, this doesn't really matter because the unemployment number also increased. The expected was 4% mm -hmm. versus the actual of 4.3%. Which is most important there? How can we deduce what's most important? I think unemployment ticking up has a bigger uh, effect on mm -hmm. the inflationary pressures, mm -hmm. i.e. dampening inflation, than the anomalous wage growth data. So I think from now on, we're going to start seeing concurrent sort of softenings in inflation. But the underlying measures really, really do matter. And it's important to take those into context as well. Um, you know, from the from the China exporting deflation side mm -hmm. of things, that is where things are coming from. We saw, you know, the supply side stuff over COVID, mm -hmm. basically all of those Chinese goods not being able to get to the West that was a massive, massive issue for inflation, you know? So that's what policymakers are now seeing, the the, the elastic band effect 
uh, kind of occur now. You know, it's a it's a real snapback from COVID times, um, and that PPI is is an important figure to watch. Absolutely agreed. I think you now refer to something really important about that inflation numbers being trickled down back to the UK. Bank of England, very much data dependent. We look into the next rate hikes, 25 basis points, probably even 50 basis points, but it doesn't seem to be an ending cycle. What, what do you see there? So th- the issue with rate hikes and how they're reported in the media, especially at such a sensitive time, is there's a meta-analysis that's been conducted on maybe 29 different studies. And I think it was released in 2020, maybe a little bit earlier. Mm. But it basically says that in developed economies, the lag time on uh, interest rate policy changes, so rate hikes or rate cuts, tends to take between 25 and 50 months Mm. to come to fruition Mm. in developed economies. And the reasoning is, is because the more financially developed they are, I guess the more liquid they are, you know, the, the, there's going to be less of a direct impact. It takes time for credit changes to occur mm-hmm. versus, you know, developing economies. Um, but the Bank of England have to be really, really careful because they're probably looking at now, okay, so there's been 14 consecutive hikes, mm-hmm. which started only, what, 18 months ago, roughly? You know, we're nowhere near that, even initial mm-hmm. 25, mm-hmm. 25 month uh minimum if you like that that meta-analysis basically looked at so we're reaching i think terminal rate and and 5.5 percent should be the terminal rate Mm. we are seeing you know guilt yields soften a little bit especially on the two year Mm. we hit that level where they reached back in 2007 and absolutely collapsed obviously with the financial crisis Mm. so i think you know we're, we're reaching a part of the story now where previously something big happened and this is how i like to look at the market as well what happened at a certain time um and are the similar issues happening again we're seeing you know london house prices down 1.8 percent very reminiscent of 2007 2008 Mm. now i'm not saying it's uh it's a similar sort of banking liquidity crisis you know trying to retell a story of what happened price reacts heavily in in similar ways you know Mm. it's a footprint so you know, we're at similar levels of 2007, eight. House prices are ticking down a little bit mm. in London. Mm. Outside, they've actually, you know, remained quite quite okay, which makes sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it, I think 5.5% and the Bank of England are going to say, well, we need to wait for these time lags to come in now yeah. because we're seeing cracks already. Perfect. I think that takes me into nice leeway into other topics that you just mentioned. Back into the US Treasury market. Um, We saw previously that when Treasury market reached a low, something cracked, and that was the banking crisis. Now we're back into that level whereby it's below that that area that it was within the banking crisis. So we do have more difficult times coming in from the U.S. How does that tie into the broader situation in the U.S.? And you know, what what do we see there? Do you mean in terms of yields? Yes, yields. Right. Okay. Yes. So I think the U.S. is a bit of a special case Mm. um, because growth is still relatively strong. Um, what we're going to have to see out of the US is that NFP number really starts slipping, mm. in my view. We're kind of at the final point with the US where, okay, we've seen the high beta jobs, as I like to refer to mm. them. So all those tech jobs at the start of the year, they've been cut. Some banking jobs have been cut as well. Right. Again, reminiscent of past times, you know, when things started to show cracks. Mm. But the problem is, is that the real I don't consider those being the real economy. Mm. They are basically an excess of low interest rates through uh, through COVID, but also before COVID. Mm. You know, the mass hiring into tech, it's just mass excess. Mm. Now we're seeing sort of that that reversion back. And for real cracks and credit problems to start to show, we have to see the real economy start to crumble. And until that NFP number starts ticking up, it's not going to make a difference. Yep. You know, it, it's, nothing's going to happen. You know, we're seeing credit card debt right at highs, so people can still facilitate it because they mm. still got jobs. Mm. It's not the rich tech people that, you know, are are, are an issue when it comes mm. to credit card debt. It's the the subprime, if you like. Yep. They're still in jobs. They can still facilitate their credit obligations. So mm. until we start to see unemployment crack, I don't see any issues with yields up there. Mm. It's, a, it's a crazy, crazy dynamic that's occurring because I'd have thought a long time ago that unemployment would have cracked, but it's just been strong consistently nfp every single first friday of each month you know it comes in strong comes in in line it's a crazy dynamic the the mandate of the fed if you really look into it they have two jobs right 
get inflation down, make sure unemployment is not too high. Mm -hmm. So you're right, it's still strong. But what happens if we suddenly see this surge of unemployment go up and they're not done yet maintaining rate hikes or even um, starting to increase rate hikes? So are we expecting them to start dropping really quickly because they know that they're in trouble now? Well, I, I, I would say so. You know, if we look back again, I like to look back at previous stories they've reacted quite quickly when mm. things have happened 2018 for example the market mm. started to mm. absolutely dump and then they had to react um i i don't think they're as uh sensitive to how the market intertwines with things mm. i think they've they, again it comes back to unemployment i think unemployment is the key driver mm. for the fed but it's an interesting topic that you bring up there you know the relationship between inflation and unemployment because powell said at jackson hole i think in 2020 that the relationship between the Phillips curve, sorry, between unemployment and inflation, which is the Phillips curve, held during the 1980s, but they it, it hasn't really held more recently. So I think that kind of alludes to the, the, the problem or the conundrum, if you like, of why unemployment hasn't cracked yet, even though inflation's high. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's because US productivity is so high. Maybe it's because genuinely the US economy is that strong. Mm. Which is a scary thought because the way I think of um, trading and, and trading opportunities, risk to reward, is what is the underlying theme that could cause a big reversion? And if it is the worker, then it's going to be a trouble in time. Um, now, that doesn't mean to short the hell out of the market because that's, that's silly. This is mm. positive expectancy mm. to, to remain long equities usually, mm. right? Um, but for underlying indices like the Russell, mm. which... I think it's 12 month trailing price to earnings ratio has been cut in half mm. versus last year. That's a problem which shows underlying weakness in smaller caps. Mm. So again, it just feeds right back into unemployment for me and general global aggregate demand. Um, and again, it's linked to China. You know, you can see the mm. demand's gone in China. That feed for effect is probably going to start happening. Germany as well. Yeah. Really, really troubling. Yeah. Um, you just mentioned about the tech sector, right? We've um, seen the FANG index retest its previous highs again. And could you like, could you provide insight into how mega cap tech stocks are responding to, we spoke about the 10-year yields and how that's been reacting, but to these structural increase in 10-year yields, how has that been impacted? We've seen this AI frenzy tech stocks tech stocks go absolutely crazy. Uh, they've pushed the S&P and the NASDAQ up almost to new highs. People, like you said, people are thinking there might be some steam left, but we now see markets reacting differently. Mm. Yesterday with the Fed minutes, they've given a strict call. And people have reacted. It was a shock to investors. We have the Jackson Hole next week again. Tie all that up for me. What do you expect next? Well, the Jackson Hole is going to be quite interesting because obviously in 2020, um, that, that's where Powell had introduced the average inflation targeting framework, mm. right? Um, I want to see if there's any mention of that again, because the, to be fair, they're approaching roughly their, their target now. And again, it comes back to those time lags, you know, how long does monetary policy take to feed through? Are they now concerned that they're reaching the upper bound of their, their limit almost, you know, they, they might reach it in under a year. Um, so it's a very interesting time, but I think, you know, the, the tech sector dynamic, the way that I like to reframe tech stocks is their, their blue chip sovereign mm. bonds mm. at the end of the day where is the safety is the safety at the moment in treasuries which are linked to inflation you know if you're taking a directional bet or is it in google facebook uh amazon which mm. are still providing earnings mm. and apart from google still providing a dividend mm. what is it where would you rather be you know we people are there's like the emotion of oh crap we might be going into a recession but then there's the reality of oh, we're not actually in a recession, unemployment's strong, mm. credit spreads are still really, really narrow. You know, there's there's so many stories coming out and I think this is where mainstream media, sorry for saying that, but <laughs> it's true. Mainstream media does a real disservice to people yeah. because they're fear-driven. Um, and if you're actually allocating capital, if you stop and pause, you're like, but nothing's actually wrong yet. There's a lot of data out there that's bad, but nothing's actually breaking we mm. saw so i mean this is a perfect example so we saw obviously silicon valley bank mm. break go bust we saw uh credit suisse go bust yeah but they're like footnotes for two weeks whereas if that was 2007 
A massive investment bank going under. God, that would have been in the news for a year. And it's because of all of the liquidity that's out yep. there still. You know, all of the, the liquidity. But the other thing as well that I think is a, a, a big change is the, 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 the introduction of the regulations and capital buffers. They couldn't make as much noise because then they'd be saying, oh, crap, like our regulations aren't working. Our capital mm. buffers, are, mm. uh, after all of these years, you know, they, they actually don't work. So, mm. yeah, a lot, a lot of stuff going on out there. But at the end of the day, people are still buying. The S&P mm. gets bid up every mm. single time it hits a low. I, again, everything points to requiring unemployment to break, to reduce mm. that credit liquidity, if you like, of people being able to use their wages to pay off their debt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Look at credit spreads, look at unemployment, see if they correlate. It's probably quite a good uh, signal to see mm. if there's there's issues coming up. Have the markets lost trust in the Fed, you think? No, they're completely guided by the Fed at every mm. single turn. Mm. Like the Fed, do you know what? I think Powell's done a fantastic job, quite mm. frankly. I know most people would like rail against him, but <laughs> what more signposting and guidance could be provided? Yeah. You know, what more could they have done? Um, they, they're kind of bound by their role at the end of the day as, as buyer of last resort. And everyone is going to pin the blame on the Fed because right. at the end of the day, they control the market. Mm. They control the direction, let's face it, the US Correct. Treasury. Um, I, I think they've done a good job. I don't think there's any credibility lost at all. I mm. think the credibility loss should be more in the governments over COVID mm. because effectively they've caused the inflation. I think we mentioned this quite quickly about um, you know, the AI-related stocks and how well they've done and how well we think it's going to continue to do. They look expensive at the moment, um, but there's still value in other parts of the S&P. So now you have a dilemma in the market saying, we're going to ruin the June and July rally, go back to the 4,100 level, or other people are saying, nope, there's still steam there. You've already mentioned this almost slightly, but what, what are your thoughts? Where do you think we'll head up in the, um, you know, um, pre-election seasonality area? So I think AI is a, a big buzzword, but as a trader, who cares? You're looking for momentum. Mm. Um, and this is where I kind of say, all right, so who cares if you don't actually like the underlying thing or you think chat GT, GPT mm. isn't actually, you know, worth that much. Mm. There's certain uses for AI, but I don't think they're replacing a human for, for, for most. I think it's a fantastic way to sort things and find information really, really quickly. But the amount of things that go wrong with it are, are, are massive. You know, mm. there's, there's so many mistakes when I've tried to sort of just find a paragraph or a little piece of, of writing to inspire some, some thoughts. Um, but that doesn't matter because other people are buying it. You know, mm. at the end of the day, you've got to throw your thoughts, thoughts away. But I think... As a factor of the general market, it is expensive. Mm. It is very expensive right now. Um, and funny enough, I think I mentioned about the 12-month trailing price-to-earnings ratio. Correct. For the Russell, that's been cut in half versus last year. For the S&P, it's down maybe, I think, like four points or something like that. But for the NASDAQ, I think it was up like five or six, mm. which shows you that AI as a sector has really, really kept the NASDAQ up, whether it's mm. been via you know, meta, whether it's been via uh, chips, you know, with with uh, NVIDIA or, or whatever. Yeah. So it's been a great narrative. It's mm. been a fantastic narrative. And I always think that, you know, if there's, as George Soros said, if there's a bubble, buy it. <laughs> because bubbles just go up, mm. you know. Um, I do think it runs out of steam. But again, I think the market runs out of steam considerable steam is, is what I mean here mm, as mm. in you know you start seeing those big illiquid drop-offs mm. um, it starts to run out of steam when we start to see unemployment it goes back to that it goes back to that because credit spreads are like that mm. and credit spreads are going to be the one thing when that seizes up probably from unemployment when people can stop paying stuff that is when things occur because what that implies what credit spreads basically implies that there's no wages being paid which means there's unemployment, right? Mm. There's there's no facilitation of profit. There's no cash flowing into mm. businesses. Yeah, they then can't pay their corporate debt, and it you know crumbles. And again, want to refer back to the Russell PE ratio. Mm. 
it's been cut in half. Mm. So we're kind of already seeing it. I think um I think there was a period in 2020 when the Russell's P was actually no, 2021, sorry, when the Russell's P was actually negative because most of the firms there weren't making money. Mm. Um so yeah, there's a lot of dying companies out there. Um but if rates were, you know, lowered quite quickly, they might turn a profit because their debt's cheaper. Mm-hmm. Um Yeah. But yeah. Credit spreads are very, very important across the whole grade as well, from A all the way down to junk. Uh, sorry, triple A all the way down mm-hmm. to junk. Um, and I think I saw that. So if you were to look at a chart of the the basis point pricing of of debt, yeah, it kind of goes like this. So you've got quite a lot of triple A debt, mm. and then it decreases. But when you get down to junk, it's a massive hockey stick again, and that's about seven hundred to. A thousand basis points, I think they're priced at. So was that seven uh, percent to to ten percent yields? Mm. There's, yeah, there's basically a lot of crappy debt out there, um, mm. and you know if rates go up again, that will increase it again up to maybe eleven percent, twelve percent. That's maybe when things seize up, but who knows? Yeah, no, fair enough. I think you're going to like this question, shifting the focus to the housing market. We mentioned this. And people aren't selling their homes necessarily, but, you know, I, I got this stat actually last night. I think it's now even more. But Morgan, mortgage rates have surged above 7.5% for the first time in decades. Um, that throws concerns about the housing market stability. Are we going to see something very similar to that 2007, 2008 crisis? But also, you, you know, we look at the um, situation having significant effect on closed sales from August to October um, and pos- potentially leading to existing home sales reaching a 13 year low. That that was like, I saw that repetitively being spoken about at Bloomberg as well. What, what do you think is going to happen there? Is this in the UK or the US? Uh, US. US. Okay. So I think the situation in the US is very different to the one in the UK. Mm. Reason being is that in the US, they've got 30 year fixes. Whereas in the UK, I think our max is five. Yeah. Now there's loads of five-year fixes that are rolling off, um, I think, around October time here and also into next year. Um, so the situation in the UK is probably much, much worse mm. than the situation in the US. And and the one thing that I think is going to be very, very troubling for the UK is I, I hope to God people don't end up being end up putting themselves into five-year fixes again when they have to refinance Mm. because they want security Mm. i think that will be a massive massive drag on the uk for the the next five years Mm -hmm. um i guess as well though there's there's those in the us that are that could refinance for 30 years but i I don't know how how many of those there are you know they there's there's probably many home buyers that have that have taken out mortgages what, two years ago when rates were lower, Mm. you know, so, and then fixed it for 30 years. I don't see the situation as being as precarious in the US as as here. Um, And also there's not the same structured products trading as as back in 2007 as well, which was obviously a a major issue for Mm. the likes of AIG. Mm -mm. Um, It's a tricky one. It's a tricky one to, to deduce because, you know, Warren Buffett's got long home builders again. I have a view that the real house price crash will occur in uh, 2026, mm. not the next year or two. Again, I think that's when the, the time lags sort of match in. You know, that I think that 25 to 50 month, I, it's, I think is the 50 month period, like mm. the upper bound is when the real house price crash will, will occur mm. from when uh, the interest rate mechanism really kicks in. Who knows though? But, you know, it, it's... It's such a tricky time, actually. Yeah. I think maybe when we get to September and we see, you know, slightly more liquid markets, we might have a better idea of things because I can't deduce for the last two, three weeks, there's been some really odd moves. Like even today, looking at the dollar, I know Mm. know, there's been some some, uh, rubbish data out of Asia, China and Japan, like Mm. Japanese exports got got hit. I think they've turned negative for the first time since 2021. Mm -hmm. Uh, the China stuff, you know, obviously shook the Hang Seng, but it's, it got bid up nice and quickly mm-hmm. in early trade. Um, but I think there's, yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff out there that seems really, really illiquid. The dollar has just gone crazy today. The Correct. euro's euro's down at one spot zero eight and a half. I think it's the yep. last time I saw it. Mm-hmm. 
Aussie down. Mm. Um, it's, yeah, I feel like it's very much August markets and it's difficult to de deduce what mm. people's true behavior is for the next quarter, say. Yeah. So September, people are back from the Hamptons. Mm. People are back from the south of France. <laughs> Maybe we can see what their real thoughts are from yeah. some of these asset managers and what direction they want to take it. But right. the euro is, this is probably one of the most underspoken uh, assets out there at the moment or FX pairs. Mm. Because if you draw a trend line, mm. right, and I'm only in favor of trend lines when they're over such a long period, mm. from I think about 2008-ish, maybe 2005, and I've got the chart in my head, but I can't remember the specific years, but we just came off um, a, 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 an almost two-decade trend line um, from about one spot, one, two. Mm. Maybe, I think it was like one spot, one, two and a half. And we're heading down now. Yeah. And every single time we've gone and touched that line, the euro's plummeted, which makes sense in the current context as well, mm. with Germany really facing issues. And especially if your currency weakens, you know, it's meant to induce demand. Mm. Um so that's definitely one to look at as well and keep an eye on over the next year or so, I think. I think the Euro's in a lot of trouble. I really, really do. Mm -hmm. Um the Euro the the Eurozone economy just looks decimated. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a nice sort of parity or not parity trade, uh, a nice uh, relative trade there between the euro and the zloty. Mm. So the Polish zloty. I think the Polish zloty and Poland in general has a good amount of support and a good amount of upside. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big, big bull on Poland to be fair. <laughs> not that that's part of the discussion today. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned about the dollar. I've certainly seen it break out that... I think it suits the Fed because you're tightening financial conditions with the bonds also going up. I think it's the direction they want to see dollar go up, bonds go up, equity markets go down. Mm -hmm. That's been the case over the past couple of days. But you said it's so volatile, so much choppiness happening in the market. So people can't expect what's going on. They can't mm -hmm. build these correlations that they've probably built before. It's it's so weird. Yeah. I think that's the word that we could use for, for that. Um, I guess kind of an, a leeway into the inflation narrative that we spoke about in the US. We, we saw oil prices and natural gas prices, maybe not today since the you know the conversation that um, oil supply remains tight to Saudi Arabia and Russia extends supply cuts, etc. But these are bound to trickle down into inflation at some point in the future. So I know we're looking at unemployment, that's the most important bit. But if you start to see inflation go back up because of all these different discussions, the Fed have no other choice but to go back into rate increases, do you think? Again, I think it does, certainly comes down to how much they think they've done already. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, what the market believes, you know, the market can go out there and price, you know, where the, where the, 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 the Fed uh, terminal rate might be in, yeah. say, six months. I think they look at what the market believes quite a lot. Yeah. Mm. Um, and I think, yeah, in, in the context of, you know, if inflation's creeping up, it matters from where. Mm. Let's say it's from wage growth. Okay, why is that wage growth creeping up? What is allowing wage growth to creep up? Are credit spreads decreasing off the back of that wage growth, which means that companies are actually in an okay position, perhaps? Um, you know, there's there's so many different components to that question that, as I said before, the underlying components of that inflation of really what matters. It's like in the UK, for example, with the NHS bonuses. Yeah. Okay, that led to high wage growth, but what does that actually mean for inflation? Like, mm. Is that something that you react to with policy or is it something that you just say, that's an anomaly, let's kind of leave it alone because mm. unemployment is up, you know, 4.3% uh, versus expected 4%. Um, so yeah, the whole context matters a lot more than just, all right, inflation's creeping up. It, it, it yeah. Like if it was coming from, say if inflation were coming from, I don't know, gas prices, like that might be something that you say, oh crap, we might have to, you know, raise rates a little bit again. Mm. Um, because it's shown perhaps that demand's there. I don't know. It's, it's such a tricky question to, to kind of, you know, make an answer to. And I guess this is where I have sympathy for, for central bankers as well, <laughs> because they have to really look at all all of this stuff and yeah. say oh god no matter what we do we're gonna get you know we're, we're gonna get it in the neck from mm -hmm. a whole group of people 
everyone's going to call us wrong. Everyone's got to shout their opinion out. Yeah. Um, Moving into, let's ignore August, going into September, September until December, what's your outlook? What are you really looking for? And what your what is your advice to traders, day and swing traders, what to look for, uh, how to base their decisions, how to approach this market, still expecting a lot of volatility? Well, I think um, I've been mentioning UK disinflation quite a lot mm. to, to my guys because I think the energy price cap has been a massive, massive support to uh, UK headline inflation. Mm. You know, it's really, really kept it up there. They probably could, because the way that I figured it out was that, you know, uh, a nat gas supplier yeah. or an energy supplier is probably going to hedge their demand mm. uh, or hedge their prices over 12 months, say. So the peak in nat gas was August last year. So I said to the guys, look, I think, you know, from July onwards, we're going to start seeing disinflation in the UK. So that means inflation's still there, but it's at a slower pace, right? Yeah. Um, that's something that so many people get caught out and mm. they're like, oh, we're in deflation because prices are going down. I'm like, no, they're still increasing just mm. at a slower rate. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, those hedges probably rolled off in July-ish which meant that you could start to see alleviation in, in the, the energy price cap. And now what we're seeing is every single month that energy price cap's going lower and lower. Yeah. What does that automatically mean for headline inflation mm. if, if the cost for people is, is going down by like 10, 20% a month? Right. It's flattening down. Yeah. So what's the potential trade there? You know, if we see that uh, UK bond yields are reacting to in, in, in the short dated stuff, they're reacting to, say, the two year is reacting to uh, the the dampening inflation, meaning the interest rates might not hold higher for longer based mm. on that inflation. Um, you might be able to sell the pound, you know, okay. versus, say, the euro. Mm. Any kind of parity that might be achieved, you know, the euro inflation has uh, it's decreased quite a lot. There's been a lot of the disinflation in in the eurozone. So you want to kind of trade that one where there's the biggest parity. Mm. So you don't necessarily want to be selling the pound versus the dollar on yeah. this one. Mm. You probably want to be selling the pound versus maybe yen, mm. but probably euro for me. Mm. Um, and I hate saying that because I hate the eurozone. <laughs> um, but there's there's also a, a, a kind of a, a flip side to that argument as well, which is how bad can the eurozone really get, mm. which might mean that, okay, forget all that we actually you know buy the pound versus the euro so there's those those two arguments that i have at the forefront yeah and that's basically what i'm balancing out going mm. into september is the euro getting really really bad mm -hmm. is uk inflation remaining sticky if uk inflation slips heavily okay we buy the euro versus the pound mm. go against consensus if uh if the euro, uh, sorry, did, what did I just say there? Uh, if it slips heavily. slips heavily. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, if we start to see a real deterioration, an even worse deterioration in the euro zone, in say Germany yeah. fought us more, France fought us more, then we want to be, you know, offering the euro versus the pound heavily. Um, um, but at times like this when I'm uncertain, I like to focus on what I can see around me. Mm. You know, I've said that I'm, I'm not too sure about um, what's really going on through August because it's quite a liquid. But I like to then focus back closer to home and say, okay, I can see what's going on in the UK. What can I play against what I can see alongside the UK data versus, you know, other assets perhaps. Yeah. So that's kind of the position that I'm taking and why I'm so focused on the UK. Got it. Yeah. It makes more sense to me. Yeah. You mentioned a lot of cross-currency pairs there. Is that your preference typically that you kind of look at what's going on between you know the swiss and the yen etc yeah i think fx just lets you because if you think about what fx is let's say you're selling equities what are you selling equities for in the us for dollars mm -hmm. right if you're selling european equities say it's a you know german stock mm -hmm. you're selling it for euro so mm -hmm. there's always a flow of currency going on right. no matter what you're doing mm -hmm. um unless you're doing it like a equity swap or something like this which mm -hmm. no one's going to do but i think fx is the purest form of uh of, of trade commerce yeah. at the end of the day and you can translate it into so many things like okay if the dollar's weak what's likely to happen to oil right oil's yeah. likely to go up mm. and then from that those very simple sort of correlations you can say okay here's the foundation of my view right dollar's weak what 
other context can I add that is going to give me the best risk to reward? Is it to go long oil? Is it to go long gold? Yeah. Is it to go long equities? Mm. You know, what is the context saying? And I think that's the way I like to to look at things. Definitely take it from an FX perspective first. Mm. Um, so it's really hard. It, trading's hard at the yeah. end of the day. Yeah. I have and and tend to have much longer time frame these days. I don't day trade. I think it's crazy unless mm. there's like a really good opportunity. Mm. Um, but I can see. But yeah, it's it's uh, it's definitely from an FX basis that I like to take yeah. things. Nice. Uh, you mentioned gold. That's really interesting because as the dollar strengthens now, you find that gold going back down. I think it's trading right under. I can't remember. I think it's. Yeah, I can't remember now, but it, it's gone down quite significantly. Do you think there's going to be a bounce um, at some point? I think gold's obviously negatively correlated with real yields. Real yields are ticking up, so that's why gold's going down. Mm. I think that's the simple relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and I think at certain times, I don't know if we can mention it, but like Bitcoin has a similar relationship too. Um, it, 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 Bitcoin tends to be a hedge against uh, the money supply mm. increasing, which is quite ironic yeah. because, you know, Bitcoiners hate the Fed, but they couldn't couldn't live without the Fed, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I think, yeah, that's just the simple relationship between uh, gold and, and, and real yields at the moment. David, it's been an absolute pleasure, man. Thanks Thank very you. much for your time. Appreciate it. Love that.